Welcome to Full Metal RPG. I'm your host, Richie Motherfucking Buzzkill. That's uh, it's episode one fourteen. Uh, I've got uh, Ashley. Ashley with us. How are you, Hi. Ashley? I'm great. I'm so happy to be back. I haven't been on the show in like a month or so. Well, so I'm. They're di- Your stands are in the in the stands. So you know. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, <laughs> I got Daryl. Daryl, my. How's it going, man? How's it going? All good, right. good, good. Life is good. Yeah. Uh, well, that's that's fantastic to hear. Fantastic to hear. Um, it's a, a Brendan free episode. Uh, he has been journeying back and forth to the realm of fire so much that his arms are tired. So um, we let him have a break, and I'm in control. All the control. Uh, so we're going to do it my way this time. Uh, so, and why, you know, we are here, uh, because of the patrons, the patrons keep us loud, live and independent. They keep us in Morkborg, uh, 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 books and streams and, uh, you know, brought us the the amazing uh, uh, new series of the Rot Marshes, where we're doing a kind of interconnected uh, Morkborg actual play, as well as on our Discord, you can come and play in the same world we're playing in on the stream. So, Brendan ran the first one. We did that on uh, uh, the last uh, last weekend, but I've released it on uh, it was on Friday. And uh, we'll have it was actually had to break it into two parter because we had, it was going to be two and a half hours long. So uh, we had uh, we had to take a break and uh, come back. And actually, it didn't take as long as we thought the second part. So to see that part, it's coming to your feed soon, maybe before this even it comes out. So enjoy that. I enjoyed it a great deal. Played a lot. Played really well. And uh, really atmospheric, and uh, I might have gone over the top with my lighting. So, uh, no, the hell you say? The hell, the <laughs> hell, the photographer nerd would go over the top with lighting. I don't know why that would be. Um, <laughs> it, it looks professional. You look like professional movie studio. You know, yeah, well, you are, the, you are the the pretty part of this show, other wow. than. Ashley and myself, we're all pretty. I was gonna say, like we're we're all stars. More and and uh, Paul in the chat is going more lighting, all the lighting, and it's like indeed, I want more lighting. I need one that's from the back so I can have a hair light, and yes, uh, yep. and and have a little and a little more from I think about this angle. So I need like at least two more lights, and maybe bigger ones. Get the bigger lights out too, because that's fun. Uh, my desk is slowly turning into a Doctor Octopus uh, lab. Uh, with all the arms coming off of it, with all the lights, so that's fun. And this one is deciding to rebel on stream at, as we speak, so that's always Same. always fun. Uh, mm-hmm. So we're going to uh, go into the black hole, because uh, why not? Uh, and we're, you know, so we're going to say, Ashley, we have not seen you in forever. What have you been up to? I, um... Missed out on playing in the Mark Borg AP last week. I was pretty bummed about that, but I had just gotten my second um, vaccine, and so I was sleeping for three days straight. I slept a lot. Um, other than that, as far as Black Hole goes, I'm still you know, doing my Pathfinder thing, which is fun. Uh, Yukon Dark got started while I was gone, which is the tiny Cthulhu actual play I'm doing with Gallant Knight Games. Um, that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, you're Maddie, at, what, episode five now? Yeah, we just did episode five on Thursday, so we're so, almost halfway done because it's going to be a twelve episode run, uh, and then okay. uh, take a break, and then after that we're going to do something else that I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about, but it'll be very cool. So uh, stay okay. tuned for that. Yeah, um, well, I, I figured with uh, with Alan involved, there's always something more. There will always be more with Alan yeah. and uh, Gallant Night Games. Yeah, so so that's been really fun. Um, Madi Murdoch is jamming, and she's incredible. Just the, the especially this last episode, some of the imagery she came up with was just like, Ugh. so which is perfect for Cthulhu. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's I, been great. 
I tuned in for a minute and I was hearing about mooses and flesh coming off of mooses yes. and I was Moose like, flaps, yes, this is awesome, but I also knees. have a bunch of, <laughs> I also yeah. have uh, other things I have to do. So I left it on and yeah. running for you so you get your numbers, but <laughs> yeah. didn't get to quite watch all of it. So <laughs> Alan messaged us um, Friday and said that the Gallant Night Games channel made Twitch affiliate already. So Oh, well, so yeah, because cool. they, they had a lot of people on there watching already. So yeah, they, you know. When you got a big, we got a, a, a nice brand like Gallant, you're going to get a lot of people coming. Unlike us who like to wear our politics on our sleeve and uh, really give everybody exactly what they don't want to know. So, <laughs> I love being part of both of them. <laughs> so, exactly, so. exactly. Uh, yeah. you, so, great. Well, is there anything else you... Nope. All right. Just well. path through, um, the D&D campaign. We were doing a... Um, one that's magic not like magic magic but i mean like the card game magic um oh, ravnica yes our ravnica campaign kind of fell off a little bit we did mm. one session and then i've gotten together since so hopefully that'll pick back up because i was excited to play just a smashy fucker and never do that yep. so uh, that would have been fun and the oh mammary alpha <laughs> i was like what's the other one uh we had like Susie needed some time to come up with more storylines. So we've been releasing episodes once a month still, but we uh, haven't gotten together to record in a little bit. And we are all, we all miss each other and want to get back to that. So hopefully we'll be getting back to recording soon. Yeah. Well, I was excited. You guys actually finished that storyline that feels I, like it went forever. <laughs> you, think you were excited to finish that story arc. <laughs> we were very excited to get through that story arc. It spanned over two seasons. It was so long, but yeah. So but I'm excited to get back into that too. But yeah, that's as far as black holes concerned. That's mm -hmm. pretty much where I'm at with that. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Daryl, my friend, how are you doing? How, have good. You, good. Do you have any uh, thing you'd I like do. to talk about in the black hole? Yeah. So I backed the solemn veil Kickstarter <laughs> that went off. And so they're going to open their backer kit. If you missed it so that you can get a copy, uh, that's, um, uh, dirty, uh, vor dirty vortex, dirty vortex. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm excited for that. I, I love the way that the kind of uh, mock-up art looked. Um, going to get myself that giant pink book with the pink dice set just because it looks cool. But urban legend horror fantastic. That's just right on my wheelhouse. So I'm excited for that. And then uh, I got my second COVID vaccine. And uh, on Star Wars Day, May the 4th, I will be fully protected by the Force and ready to uh, <laughs> encounter the world again. So been thinking about putting the band back together man getting Hell some yeah. people around the table some other vaccinated individuals and rolling some dice because i have missed it i have missed uh opportunities to role play so um yeah that's what i got going on uh other than i guess one of my friends recently started playing malifaux third edition so that uh caught my eye a little bit and i don't want to get back into it but i might because <laughs> i like miniature monsters well um so. You, you, there's always at least get into painting again. That's always a, yeah. you know, the, the great part about that. The hobby is the kind of Zen art of painting. As long as you're <laughs> frustrated yeah, I, with how terri <laughs> terrible, terrible so, it's going. So, so when my kids took off last week, they stole my entire paint set, um, which I'm really excited for because it hasn't been used in a while. And mm. I'm excited. Uh, Gabe, who has never painted a figure or wanted to paint a figure in his life, was like dad i've got all this shit i need to paint and i'm like yes so i'm excited to see what they've got when they come back today and uh what they've been working on all week so yeah that'll be exciting too um but yeah that's what i get going on and uh we hit bookman's last night and i found the vampire requiem player screen so my collection is slowly becoming more co complete player screen or right, i'm sorry gm screen i was like yeah <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Every player gets their own thing. How there you go. Sad. Nobody gets to see each other's roles. Yeah, it's all done right. in secret. Just wait, don't go the ultimate in dice fudge <laughs> plus uh, bluffing <laughs> mechanics. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that sounds great. Uh, and also, if you want to check, you're not so sure about Silent Vale, which you should be because it's pretty cool. Uh, our friends over at Red Moon Role Playing have a couple of uh, Solemn Vale uh, actual plays. So if you wanted to listen to those, it is very much like a, uh, what do you call it? Like folk horror, like going to these small British towns and there's something weird going on and it's 
it's very cool. It's it was it was nice. they they always do an amazing job over there. Um, and also also speaking of what I'm doing, I'm listening to their they started doing a, a, a Dark Sun actual play, but second edition proper Dark Sun, not fourth edition. They're doing second edition D and D Dark Sun actual play, and I was like, yeah, I'll take that. That's thank you. And, and it's been a lot of fun, and it kind of reminds me how kind of bonkers that was. But uh, uh, I have been, uh, well, I uh, was on the actual play for the, the Morkborg uh, for, with Brendan. That was that was a lot of fun. That was really interesting. We really dug deep. We had Christopher Gray on there, uh, one, of, one of our good friends, and he really brought it. And he rolled a, uh, what was it, a had a tiny dog and he called it isolation or something like that. And the tiny dog is also a weapon that can, you can send out to like attack. <laughs> it's like in the, in the uh, book is something random you can have. Um, <laughs> I, I was, when you said you could use the dog as a weapon, I was picturing yeah. something very different, <laughs> right? Well, it's more of a pet, I get, you know, traditional pet idea in RPGs, but this is such a, that's such a weird thing to say in like a, uh, to have a tiny dog in a do metal inspired role-playing game. Like, it's just, <laughs> Yeah. But it was a fantastic time. And um, and then I ran uh, actually yesterday for um, a, a, a crew over uh, of our patrons and uh, Brendan played and uh, we had uh, we had a really great time. Uh, I, I took them out to the uh, a, a, a giant a, a lighthouse that's on the edge of a, a misty cliff. And uh, they fought some uh, they found that there was a cult that using the the magical sphere from this uh this uh lighthouse to try and summon their dark god so you know they had to figure out how to stop that and they sort of did <laughs> sort of you know not permanently just kind of like oh there are too many of them we're just gonna steal the globe and make sure they can't get to it for a moment so uh so the the uh the possibility of going back to that place is very high because uh you know it's they <laughs> it's it's still there and uh had a lot of fun running that and then uh yeah i've been keep i'm playing um uh 13th age still so my barbarian with his uh arm that is is powered by rage um continues to uh uh do massive damage to uh uh the uh these the drug dealers were chasing down who were supplying dead bodies to uh to necromancers so um yeah so that was that was that's been a good time and you know that's that's pretty much i think about it i mean i think uh i've been roped into building a uh uh a, a star breach uh, uh uh army for for uh with brendan so uh that's gonna be some stuff we're gonna see on the uh youtube channel uh and um uh, probably on here too on on the stream but uh we're uh it's it's kind of a so little nice little project it won't be too too much uh i mean a lot of work for me but hmm? yeah when that came out i remember all of us back then we're just like oh we're gonna all get together and play this and then like everything happened all this <laughs> happened yeah so um yeah so i have it and i, I was actually looking at it the other day because i got the dice with it and stuff and i was like these are so cool and i want to use them so yeah, so that's awesome. Well, the uh, we're doing the star we're we're calling it the Star Breach Challenge, Star Breach Challenge, which is hard to say in real life. Probably probably not the best. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, basically we're gonna buy. There's a there's a manufacturer that manufactures like mi miniatures called uh, War Games Atlantic. We're buying one box off of them, which is about thirty bucks, and then we're buying one mech from somewhere. Many many manufacturers make a mech. And that's going to be our war band for that. Mm -hmm. So like 60 to 70 bucks for a full miniatures uh, war band, skirmish war band. And I'm, I'm getting, li there's lizards men, lizard men that have uh, gas masks. They have gas masks heads or regular lizard man heads. So yeah. well, that'll be fun. So yeah, that's fun. Very cool. So, very cool. Well, that's our journey through the black hole. Uh, I, uh, I think it's always fun, and we're gonna get into the uh, the topic uh, here. So the topic is: Does story structure exist with players at the table? So 
the idea would be, you know, you, you go and sit down and write your story in this five act structure. Shout out to Nolan for loving five act structures. Uh, and, and you, you sit down and you play and does, does that really translate? Is that a thing, uh, to, uh, really get into that? So, um, I'm going to throw this to, uh, to Daryl. Daryl, what do you, what do you, uh, what kind of your opening thought on this uh, particular idea? As a dirty hippie gamer who cut my teeth on all kinds of story games, um, the concept that you create a story, you're creating a universe, things are happening in that universe, those things happen regardless of who's around to witness them or interact with them. And so, in general, um, there's a way to craft a story that can survive contact with players and player ideas. Uh, it's just kind of a skill to learn. So, yeah, I, I fully believe that story exists with players. Uh, and furthermore, that players are integral to creating and crafting that story. So there's my dirty hippie hot take. We'll get into that more. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. And Ashley? <clears throat> uh, I think that if you as a GM are you're writing an entire story and you just want your players to kind of play the parts, then you need to do a play reading. You give them a script, you know, just be like, read these things. This is what I want to happen. And this is what you have to do because I've definitely played with GMs where they knew exactly what they wanted to happen. And in order for these next things to happen, you had to do it this way. So as the player, you're completely boxed in there and that's, that's no fun. Um, so kind of to Daryl's point, you create a universe and you create this kind of sandbox for them to play in, but what they do, like how they're playing is kind of, that's part of the fun of playing is that you're all creating it together. It's not you creating the story that they're just playing out. You're not Shakespeare. So. Right. And, and my conceit is, and this is the reason I, cause I have a take that's right. Why, uh, it was so fantastic that Ashley found this, uh, topic that I have a high, hot take <laughs> upon, uh, in one of our documents, uh, <laughs> um, is that story structure is something you put on to a store, a, a series of events after the series of events is over. It's like a war or a sporting game, like people will be like, oh, they really came back from this huge deficit. Like, well, they did, but the this series of events really didn't is only interconnected by the same people being in it. Like it's 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 not um, when you're uh, trying to uh, talk through these series of events like, oh, well, they went down the dungeon, they found out about the, the dark wizard and then the dark wizard found out about them. And, and that, that's the first act. And then like, you know, it's like, no, it's just stuff that happened in your game. And then you're putting on this, uh, structure over top of it. Now, is it helpful to write that way? Yeah. I think it's helpful to at least get you in the mood of like, it, it helping it's another it's another aid as a game master but i find you know especially in shorter games that we basically run nowadays especially on on online because you know it used to be we'd do you know five hours in person well or you know four or five hours in person and now like i run like two three hours and the first half hour 45 minutes is trying to get people's cameras and microphones working. Like it's, it's almost like this show is training for, to, to do online games. It's just one of those things. And, uh, it, it's really not about trying to hit these like, Oh, well, I'm going to get them in danger in the third act. It's like, I'm just going to try and get them somewhere, anywhere to have something interesting happen. Like, and, uh, that's kind of why I think that, uh, it, it, it's another aid like uh, story the story beats engine from like uh, um, Kent, uh, Robin D Laws there 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 is a story that's like oh well now it's going to be the cliffhanger right you know, you know I was I was used to love to end on a cliffhanger like oh well they'll bring them back to the table right but realistically I just forced that on them because it's, you know, they're railroaded <laughs> like, Oh, and then the evil bad guy shows up at your door and, but he's bloody, you know, like, <laughs> and scene. <laughs> yeah. I think for people that enjoy writing, because 
the draw for jamming for some people that I know anyway is they like writing, they like creating the story, and uh, the way that my GM for Pathfinder does that is he gets that out as like a an epilogue. So when we finish a certain module or adventure path or anything like that, when we finish this section, he does a whole epilogue. Like this is what happened. And so he still gets to have his creative writing that he wanted to use this for. It's kind of an outlet for him, but he still lets us do what we're going to do in this world that he's created. So um, one of the things that Daryl actually told me a ways back when I was starting to run was um, to do beats, to use beats. And that really helps because if you have kind of an idea of these are some things that I want to hit, but I don't care how we get there. I don't care what order they're in or anything like that. Like you just know that you want to incorporate these things. I think that makes it a lot easier um, as, as the GM. It makes it a lot easier for you to just be like, these are the things I want to hit, but how they get there is completely up to them because you want it to be fun for your players too, because you do want them to come back, not just because there's a cliffhanger, but because they enjoy being there. Yeah, no, that, that seems uh, like what I was saying was I was running that Morkborg game the other day. And uh, like, I had this whole thing where like, they were going to go to the lighthouse and kind of meet something. And then they were going to go to the village that was below the lighthouse and then go, the villagers were going to kind of direct them to where this cave where this crazy cultists are. And, you know, I had to like go, okay, well, I have like 45 minutes left. We're just going to chop all this out <laughs> and we're just going to get to this. We're, we're not going to go to a crazy cave. The cultists are doing their ceremony on the beach, right? Why, <laughs> Why yeah, not? And that, that is uh, really important. And one of the GM tips that I, I try to give people that Ashley and I have discussed and, and I've discussed with many new GMs is the three by three. You're, you're not crafting a scene. If you go into it and you've got a vision of what that scene looks like in your head, you're going to fail nine times out of 10 because the players aren't going to be there. They're not going to have the right clothes on. They're not going to have the right items. They're not going to have talked to the right people. So you don't work on crafting the scene. You work on crafting the idea of the scene um, like you did with your cultists. The, the idea of the cavern that they're exploring and spending hours trying to find, you know, follow the breadcrumbs down to the cult ritual, whatever it is, um, is appealing. And it's a neat idea but it's stressful as a GM to try and herd people onto that path. So instead, the beat is they have to discover the cultists. And if you just leave it as one word, cultists, put cultists wherever they fit into the story at the right moment that they fit into that story. Uh, if it's at the local library, they're in the basement. If it's in the cave, cool. If it's on the beach, awesome. But the beat that you need is the cultists. So you, you just you hold that in your pocket and you say, I have cultists. I need them to be there somewhere. And at some point, it's going to be the right moment to insert cultist into the story uh, and let the players decide where they go. You know, if they take a, a vacation to Hawaii, now you've got Hawaiian cultists, you know, <laughs> it, it can be flavored by the story that the players make. But you've got the beat in there somehow. Yeah. And and like um, I hear writers talk about characters like characters not doing what they want them to do, like the idea that something you're writing is just like going off the rails on the page. Like y your characters are going off the rails. It's like, that's just like player characters, except more, you know, times 10, right? So like even people that are writing their own scripts and, and you know, other things, it's like, oh, well shit, we, can <laughs> we can't depend on anybody. Like even ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was running uh, Tiny Frontiers at a convention and I had, so I had like a couple different days and I had like a certain amount of games per day or whatever. Uh, I had a very loose outline that I'm like, okay, something goes wrong with their ship. They have to figure out what's going on with their ship. And then there's going to be this planet and this is where they're going to have to go to fix it. And so it's a very loose, like, this is kind of what's going to happen. But as far as like, they had different encounters each time. Uh, they handled them differently each time. Because if I had said like pages of writing, this is exactly how it's going to go it would not have gone that way. Like it never goes that way. That's kind of one of the like jokes about role-playing games is that your players are never going to do what you think they're going to do and what you want them to do. So you need to leave it loose. So I like the outline 
it's it's kind of like the beats, but I do kind of an outline of just these are the main points that I want to hit. How we get there and how it happens is totally up to the players. Yeah, well, and and that's kind of how you have to kind of have that attitude. I mean, you know, that we talk about people talk about railroading GMs. Like this yeah. is the this is like the the fix a lot of people had come to to this idea of story structure is like no, literally you're you're in a mine car in the Disney you know in the Disneyland resort going up and down and through my story where I've got mechanical bears swinging at your head and like then I'm going to have a hobgoblin like burst through in front of the cart and your cart's going to turn and it's like eh, is that really any f- I just it sounds so dreadful as a GM to like try and force people in this yeah. very narrow thing and I know as a player that's particularly awful so uh you know, there there are games where I will be more amenable to that, which is usually like a con game, because I know we have a very limited amount of time, and I'm willing to like forego some of my player agency in order right. to kind of go along with this thing, you know, to test out this this the game that we're here to play, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and that's one of the things Daryl and I were talking about yesterday when we were discussing, we were pre-discussing the topic for today, um, was that that can't be fun for the GM either. Like, that's, it's fun when you get to play as the GM. So if you are, yes, and, and, like, using your improv skills when it comes to that, it makes it more fun for you, too, instead of you just trying to get them to act right and do what it is you want them to do. Yep. Yep. So, so to take this... Uh to the flip side because we're talking about the interaction between players and story and when we talk about railroading that's on like one swing of the pendulum and then in the middle there's you know uh, GM crafted a good story and the players have enough buy-in and we all understand the contract at the table that you know you're not going to go rogue and and opening scene move your character to Toledo Ohio because you know it's just gonna you you're just intentionally missing plot but there's the other swing of the pendulum, which is where I started my, my GMing career way back at the table with you, Mr. Richie Buzzkill, was uh, <laughs> oh, no. I, I have an idea. <laughs> I'm sitting here at the table and um, gosh, what, I don't even remember what the plot was for the first game. Uh, was the that the Lord, game. Of the, it was the Lord of the Rings one, right? Lord of the Rings was second. No, I, I thought... Was that where we started? Yeah, I thought yeah. We... Oh, yeah, yeah. It was the two-part Lord of the Rings. So, yeah, it was Lord of the Rings, right? I had a concept of the history of Mordor, um, but I kind of let you all figure out what the rest of it was. And then game three was literally I sat at the table and I decided to uh, pull out. When I was back in high school in speech and debate, I, I did prose uh, as my main competition because I just loved reading and being dramatic. Um <laughs> But my coach put me into um, impromptu speaking to punish me for not preparing anything else, I guess. And being put on the spot with a topic and just being told to go was like the most horrifying thing on the planet. But it was also the biggest drug on the planet because I can't get enough of it. So the third session that year that I ran, the third game I ran, was literally like, okay, everybody, I want you to write down a monster on a piece of paper and hand it to me. Just give it a name. Give me like three things about that monster. Give me a location and three things about those lo- that location. And give me a character and three things about that character. And so six players hand me these randomized, like one person wanted a unicorn, one person wanted a dragon, one person wanted a swamp monster. One person said that the uh, there was a crystalline castle. And so I, I had all of these elements and I just... I sat down, I said, okay, give me five minutes, go get some water. And then we sat down and we played a game that then had an extra wrench thrown in that I had some players show up late and they were handing me slips of paper from off the table, just like, and now you're doing a this thing. And I was playing, whose line is it anyway? The RPG. (laughs) 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 Which you should have totally written by now, by the way. You should have just totally (laughs) written that as like a one pager, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, and the, the, the players are just going to be able to hand you strips, slips of paper, and that will change the direction of the scene just mm-hmm. for the lulls. Like, you know. <laughs> it's like the you GM challenge mode. Yeah. That became my GM style. Um, I find that when I sit down and I try to write too much story, I it gets in the way. Whereas when I let the players tell me what the story is, um, the first session of Monsters and Other Childish Things that Ashley played in with me, uh, we sat down. Our session zero was, all right, you tell me what the story is. 
and we ran with it from there. And I took all the elements and I kind of smushed them together and made a big ball of wibbly wobbly story wimey stuff. And that's what we ended up playing with. And it ended up being really cool to explore that with the players. But mm -hmm. that is, I think, the other swing of the pendulum is that your players can't interfere with your story if your players are creating the story. And you as a GM, um, a lot of people that step into the GM seat um, come from being players first. Very few people are born natural wanting to run GMs. We're all terrified. We all sit in that seat and we're like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? <laughs> or they're forced um, to be there because no one else wants to do it. Like the first yeah, game yeah. is like somebody had to D GM the first game and that's you, sucker. So, <laughs> yep. so you sit there and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. But remove all that pressure and be the GM player who is like, okay, the GM is sitting in the seat providing a series of uh, story beats and ideas and characters for the players to interact with, which is fantastic. And the players don't know what's coming next. When you flip that script and you as the GM don't know what's coming next. <laughs> oh my God, that's fun. It is so fun because you're just like, no, I, I have no idea. At the end of the session, you're just like, now I've got 10 more ideas. The players gave me all this wonderful feedback, all these new elements to incorporate. Um, Oh, it's, it's wonderful. I highly recommend it to everybody because, uh, yeah, it's being a railroady GM will never be my style. Um, mm. I, I don't run adventure modules for that reason. Just I can't even just flip open a book. And uh, that's intimidating to me mm -hmm. to try and think about running. So mm -hmm. um, give it a shot. Just like let your players tell you what the story is, uh, even if it's just a couple of beats or from scratch. Just mm -hmm. give me 10 things and let's go. Well, let me recommend let me recommend something real quick is when I ran my, my Mork Borg session, they have a, a thing called the dungeon in it, it's a dungeon generator, but here's what it outputs mm -hmm. here. It's basically a title, right? You got a title, you get a couple things that are happening and what kind of the a vague location. And then you get like, um, what is it? Uh, what, what brings you here? You can even like the story hook. It gives you that. Now you, I ignored that because we already have this amazing story of like everyone is a uh, a, 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 co a penal colonist resident who is being moved around the board by these uh, terrible uh, uh, families and stuff like that. So that, I didn't have to ignore that. But tell me what the entrance to the dungeon looks like. What's by the entrance of the dungeon? Just ran like a weak grotesque, which turned into hey, there's these cultists that are amphibian that they, are, they have turned amphibian because they worship this mad god. Like, not not that they've, uh, not as uh, somebody called them fish fuckers, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like in uh, in the Dunsmith, right? You've got the deep ones coming and mixing with the uh, the uh, villagers. But like, the, you know, that sort of thing. But it, it gave me as basically the prompts for like your yes and game. It just like, Gave me just a sh one sheet that's like, this is the whole dungeon, do with what you will. And I, I started writing notes all over it. And I, I had a relatively uh, good plan to not, that couldn't really be crushed by the players because it was so loose that they could, they could worm their way through the cracks. And it's like, oh, if they all wanted to like say, fuck it and go off into the middle of this terrible island and like go play Lord of the Flies. I'd been up for that too, but like they all seem to be like, well, no, it's, it's safer even in the terribleness of the ghetto that they lived in back in the city. So like was better than living in the terrible, terrible wilderness with all the creepy crawly uh, mm -hmm. creatures. So, mm -hmm. um, what I was going to say about the, tiny supers when we were doing our superhero world that we were going to play the different types all in the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just the full metal RPG crew was, uh, when there was shit that you guys were coming up with that. I was like, yeah, sure. There's a robot dog. You chase it. Like, cause <laughs> you wouldn't leave the dog alone. I was like, yeah, it ran away. I chase it. I was like, fuck. Okay. So, uh, we're chasing this dog <laughs> and <laughs> it goes around the corner and, uh, you don't see it. Okay. Well, I keep going. Of course you do. Okay. So then there's this, <laughs> this bush and it's behind that. And then you find this portal and it went into it. And so, yeah, it was just what ended up happening was that, that portal, by the way, since it kind of fell apart and you guys aren't playing it anymore yeah. anyway. Um, the reason Brendan reacted with it is because he was an alien. And so these dogs were actually going to be from this alien 
dimension that he was from and they were coming back to try and get him because he was someone and blah blah blah. Oh, okay. That was not originally in the story at all, but since you guys were like, let's chase the robot dog, that's just where the story went. So <laughs> all of, it just it changed everything. So if I had a very strict story set I would have had to completely redo it every session. So Right. Well and and, yeah. and that's sort of the you know, with players at the table, you often end up with them in love with like the bread maker or some right. some shit. The the Smith mm-hmm. becomes the most important character in the yeah. town, no matter how much they're not connected because you gave them a name that tweaks somebody's brain and like <laughs> they're like now now they're the central part of this village and then you gotta figure out yes. what the fuck to do with them. <laughs> in my Pathfinder One campaign, the Emerald Spire, there is an NPC. He was just a random NPC. His name is Abernard and he is this old cranky wizard. But the way our GM played him and the voice he did and how he interacted with the characters we loved him and Abernard is not anywhere in the rest of the story at all, supposedly like, but mm-hmm. he keeps coming back because we just love him so much, you know? So it it's true. Like you'll just pick the most random NPC and everyone's just like, I love him so much. Like he turned <laughs> one of our players into a weasel. And so now her nickname is Wheezy and it's just <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. But you, you have to be flexible to be able to do kind of stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah. It is funny how they just randomly pick the most, random things to fall in love with <laughs> well and that and that's why story structure i think is just not you, you it's fun to write in that way and it, it you yeah. know, but but the players are going to get obsessed with something mm-hmm. it could just be some random side plot that you thought oh well this is my side plot mm-hmm. like oh there there's clearly you're going to help somebody and they're going to give you a thing and then right. where no that turns out that that was the evil wizard that you helped and then because you they're so obsessed with this side plot that they could give well i'm going to just bring it back around here that's mm-hmm. that's the other trick is like i'm going to uh, it's like i call it like story keto like you're just taking the energy from them turning it around <laughs> and then throwing it back at them right it's yeah. it's like moving them it, it is uh, a very interesting thing, especially a lot of story games. A lot of story games try to mimic uh, the three act structure. Act structure is kind of like, okay, we're going to have three scenes. That's going to be your first act as as a way of structuring it. But in the end, like, does it really? Is it really get you getting you any closer to the you know actual story? Those three scenes. Well. You know, some some of them do a great job, but they're still not a story structure, <laughs> no matter what the the game says. So, yeah. Well, so another element to story structure is um, arc versus story or arc versus scene. Um, I can't remember where I read this many years ago. I was I was prepping games, and the idea was that there is a large story arc that's happening, and that's the story that you're telling. Um, the evil wizard who is trying to gain godlike powers. And that's your big arc. And so from session one, there's some clues that that's happening. There's some children missing from the local village. The players decide to make best friends with the smith and help the smith find his hammer in Lost in the Cave. Finding the hammer lost in the cave does nothing to stop the evil wizard. And so the next session, the evil wizard has gathered the children and is performing some horrible ritual um, raising the tower. And so the players decide to follow a pig and get lost in the forest and help some elves and, and make strawberry jam, whatever it is they're doing. <laughs> does nothing to stop the wizard. So you've got all of these little things that the players are doing that you can get stressed out as a GM and say, this has nothing to do with my big arc story. But this big story is still happening. Mm-hmm, make sure mm-hmm. that you as the GM let that big story still happen. And whatever is happening in that big story, even if the players aren't directly interacting with it, Make sure that you're giving them hints, you know, there, there's a tower being built in the distance. Uh, oh, okay, cool. And then <laughs> if at the end of the big arc, they still haven't interacted with it, they've got a much bigger problem on their hands. But you let the situation escalate whether or not the players are dealing with it. And then you create your individual beats like, okay, you chase the pig into the forest and you find a pile of corpses. You know, and that could have something tied into your larger arc. So you've got all these little stories that the players want to do tied into a larger arc. Um, And it really helps to to remember that a world is a persistent place that happens whether or not the players are interacting with it. Uh, Every day is a day gone by and every day wasted is a day wasted. And let the players make that decision. Um, But make sure that you're pointing them point out in big neon signs. 
clue by four that something well, big is happening. Signpost. There's a something. sign with it. <laughs> it's, it does, it's not the shape of a sign, but it's just a signpost that says wizard doing things. Eh, yep. I'm just going to walk past that. Like, why would I, <laughs> why would I bother myself with random wizards? We can do nothing about this. We're po- <laughs> lowly level one characters. We can literally not do anything about this. Like, okay, the world <laughs> sucks. We're going to, we're going to go ha- have fun with the, the uh, pie eating contest in the, the mm-hmm. fair next in the next village. Like, okay, mm-hmm. sure enough. <laughs> yep. But yeah, but it's like the, um, the idea of clocks uh, from uh, Powered by the Apocalypse and other story games that ha- they basically have like this th- this arc is happening, this big story arc is happening, and when uh, it'll it tells you like okay the first quarter or you kind of divide up a circle into high wedges of different sizes or just and then go oh when when the player characters do this or this much time has passed you fill in one of these and then the next thing's happening right it's it's really mechanicalizing the the idea of these arcs but it also kind of um brings to the forefront and when by when you get to uh fortune of the dark games you literally put those clocks on the table to show players that these are things that are happening right so there are ways of kind of bringing them back around, as it were, but um, you know that just depends on how tight how tight you want to be. But I, I do like giving them like a visual sign of this clock that says like "Doomsday Wizard," <laughs> mm-hmm. and all of a sudden it's filling. It's like what the hell? You know, it it does sharpen their focus quite well to like that idea is when you start bringing that into the uh, into the mix. So. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I like that. I'd never heard of that before, but I like that idea. Yeah, it's it's yeah. from Apocalypse World, and most of the Apocalypse-based games have it in it, but also most of the Blades in the Dark games. Mm-hmm. And and it, it really, you know, because if you've got, like, in those games, you're supposed to basically have one front or one arc, kind of big arc for, like, each player. So trying to keep track of all that is quite difficult (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and and having those having this sheet that basically is like oh wait they did this thing and and now the world has changed because they did that and then you can kind of feed that back into the narrative you're telling so it's um you know there's a lot of great innovations in story games that kind of help you go back a little bit to railroading but they they it's fed by the yes and kind of nature of the improv of those kind of games which is what makes them fantastic is you can both correct a story and completely go off rails and still be Mm -hmm. fine (laughs) which is i'm my background i'm a drama nerd and so it's like that's why all of my theater friends if they are not playing i don't want to say just D &D, but if you're not playing like role-playing games why not because it's what it is and if you you have that yes and mentality it's going to serve you so well in this type of environment so it's the the ability to think on your feet and to move things forward when things are thrown at you that you weren't expecting that ends up as a player and as a gm that ends up serving you really well it's it makes it so much more fun it's a good way to flex those muscles and uh you know uh, me me poor makes a, a good point in the sound. It sounds vaguely adversarial between the game master and the GM when we're talking about these story structures. Yes. And I could see, you know, that very much is a dynamic that has been going on, on going on for a long time. And I feel like, you know, to Daryl's idea of like, everything is yes. And, and you're, you're using what what's coming in that the newer, what I'll call more modern storytelling methods, I think kind of, it's not adversarial so much as you're using their energy to feedback on, on. And while yes, back in the day, I think it was very much an adversarial, like you're not, you didn't go around the right hallway or you didn't find the clue. So clearly you've screwed my entire story. Like uh, the whole, the whole idea of a mystery game is broken until you get to gumshoe system, like where Mm. you're supposed to give the players all the clues that just what they do with them. Right. If you tried to run it in D and D before that idea of like, take would be just, it would just be, uh, uh, you know, I've been in those games. It's terrible. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Don't be stingy with clues for sure. Yeah. The clue by four is real. And I think that the, uh, uh, I think giving, giving players 
all the clues and letting them do things with those clues is is the better way to do it. And you can get into trying to create story structure that way, but I don't really see it necessary. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it's just like if you have a building that's too rigid, if there's an earthquake or something, it's going to collapse. You need a little bit of flexibility to it. So if you are the type where you're like, this is the story I want to tell and you have specific details you want to put in it, like you can, you can try, you can certainly try, but um, it's, you still have to be flexible. I mean, if you, like I said at the beginning, if you have a story that you want to tell specifically, then just give people a script and do like a table read <laughs> if this is what you want to do. But if you want to actually play a game, let them play the game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've, yeah. I've definitely been at those tables for sure. <laughs> yes, I think everyone has. And that's why it's, you learn from all of the GMs that you've ever had. You know, you learn good things that you want to keep and you learn things that you're like, hmm, that sucks. I'm never doing that. So that's one of the <laughs> never things. Never doing is... naval combat again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to the point about it being adversarial, um, the contract of the table, and literally, I mean, people who have sat at my table have seen my contract at the table. There is a contract that is very short. It's we come to this table to have fun and play games. Um and it's the I, the idea starts from we have a story to tell and we want to tell that story and the players have to buy into that story to a certain extent. I as the GM need to tell a story and involve the players in that story and involve their feedback in my story to make it fun. And that's what it comes down to is it's going to be fun, uh, but there needs to if there's never any consequences to actions, then we're just we're going to story tell ourselves into my little pony game tales of equestria uh (laughs) where there is no way to fail so it's not about punishing the players with failure it's about letting them make decisions showing them the consequences of those actions reminding them that there's a story and trying to keep them on track with that story and if halfway through a session or halfway through your big arc they're not getting on board with it adjust that arc you know um your conclusions shouldn't be written in stone your story idea conclusion shouldn't be written in stone the the first monster monday game i ran because i started my world of darkness monster monday series uh, i had this really cool arc figured out it was going to be a long arc that was going to lead them to understand that um there was a ritualistic werebear combat going on and i had at least four sessions planned for it and session one they murdered my big bad the biggest clue like straight up one shot it. And I was like, Shh. and we've all had that happen. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. What do you do from there? Well, you just, you adjust on the fly. My conclusion was moved up a few sessions and then we moved forward from there. Uh, and I liked uh, Richard earlier, you shared that story map. I love that concept too. Uh, but to remove the adversarial aspect, it's not about punishing the players. It's about crossing off those story ideas when they no longer fit your story. Uh, there's a, one of my friends is a really good writer and she taught me the kill your darlings. When you have a story that you want to incorporate into the subtext or as a side plot or whatever, and it's the story that you really want to tell and it's super important to you, but you find out that it's just not fitting into the chapter structure or the bigger story, murder it, just cross it off, get rid of it, let something fill its place, um, be flexible. So yeah, Ashley, you were saying earlier, be flexible. Yeah, that's a big part of this, too. Um, so don't don't take it out on your players. Don't be like, oh, you didn't do my story, so now I'm going to make it difficult. Just acknowledge that failing to interact with bigger plots leads to bigger consequences, and make sure your players are aware of those consequences and those building issues while they're having fun with their whatever part of the story they are interacting with. And to the point of it sounding adversarial, um, I could see it being adversarial in that if you have the story you want to tell and they're doing this other thing, it becomes this power struggle at the table where instead of just creating this world and playing in it together, um, it is, you know, GM versus the players that the players are like, I want to do this. And GM's just like, absolutely not. And they're like, well, okay. And so it becomes this thing where it's just, again, power struggle, um, which is not fun for anyone. That's just stressful. No one wants that. Like you play games to have fun. You don't play games to you know, get stressed out by them, I guess. Although some of them that are really fun are still stressful. So. Well, I think I think there are people that actually play for the that feeling. Like I think yeah. there's like every single kind of feeling you can get at the table. Mm-hmm. Like everyone, uh, you know, gets that kind of like. And there are people that want to make, and I, I think they tend to not be very popular because 
a lot of people are interested in this is the winnable RPG, right? Mm -hmm. The, that I have won this RPG like that, that idea is I'm, I'm heard people trying to get to that point, like trying to design that kind of thing. Heck, I was even designing this basically kind of like civil war game. It was not civil war. It was like civil war two, essentially it was anyway. Uh, it was, it was basically going to have a strategy game in, incorporated into it. But in the end, it was really more about the experiences of the characters in these, you know, strategy games, kind of going back to where D and D kind of came from in the first place, which is, you know, you had these big epic battles and like, well, what if I just play one guy, right? What if I want to play one woman on the, on the battlefield, like, and really experience what they're experiencing. I was trying to recreate that by like having like a strategy turn where you're moving your, your, your Mm. armies around. And then, whatever that interaction happened would drive a scene between your strategy rounds. So then at Mm -hmm. the end afterwards, whatever characters had survived, you would, I kind of demanded that you end up at basically Arlington national cemetery where you had this, like had the two sides, the two big characters kind of came together in front of a, a, another mm-hmm. a grave you know kind of thing it would you know, very you know it didn't work at all <laughs> it sounds cool though like it sounded like it was a good idea to go with yeah i just needed i needed like to fully concentrate on it and not do a bunch of other stuff and continuously develop it till i liked it and mm-hmm. i just kind of gave up on it because yeah. i couldn't find people that would actually play test it with me so <laughs> and mm-hmm. this, this yeah. you know when you're doing something this experimental being in person was is much more of a Mm-hmm. Uh, a thing. I don't know if I would try to play test something like that online, but yeah. If it sounds interesting, you know, let me know. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So that was uh, it, it, if closing thoughts. How about closing thoughts? Any anybody have any uh, final thoughts, Daryl? Uh, my closing thought is I just peeked over at the Twitch and. Um, you didn't kill the wizard, so now you can go back to pie contests in a world ruled by demons. Uh, <laughs> pie contests in a world ruled by demons is my next game, and I thank you very much for that story. Uh, I will give you full credit on uh, that one. That's, that's Meepor. Uh, that's Meepor. Yeah. Meepor. Look, look, uh, thank, thank you, Meepor. Uh, look for me at uh, Comic-Con next year, and I will run pie contest demon world. Uh, I hope I'll see you there as a player in the game. Uh, outside of that, though, um, players versus story. Um, players are your story players create story let your players help you with the story you as the gm have a lot of pressure on you already to set up a table to have extra dice to hopefully make nice snacks i i I have a lot of pressure i like nice snacks um let your players write some story for you let them do some of the legwork let them be your story uh, and include their characters and their characters wants and needs um, in your story, it's going to be so much more rewarding when it's not players exploded my story and now I'm angry and frustrated. And instead, it's uh, did you say they were cannibals? Um, yeah. Uh, okay, they're cannibals now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Mm. Ashley? I think as a GM, you are going to have more fun if you just give up control. Like, just realize that you don't control shit when it comes to your players. Um, you you've crafted this sandbox so they're playing in it let them play in it and have fun you get in it and play in it too and the more that you are flexible and try not to control everything the more fun you're going to have it's all about thinking staying on your toes thinking on your feet all of those other whatever i can't think of the word right now <laughs> but you know what i mean adaption. it's a lot of fun adaption. yes adaptation yeah, adaption there you, go. there you go that do that it's a lot more fun <laughs> <laughs> um I would like to state again that I think story structure is something great to write to, uh, but it is not really something you should be sticking to in game. Uh, the point of these games is the kind of random, the random nature of the dice is supposed to help you tell a story. Now I played full improv games that have no dice in them and those work too, but they're, it's a different thing. It's, Maybe that's a whole nother topic. Uh, but uh, I think uh, having the ability to be flexible and remember that you're a player too as a game master. Every, it's everybody around the table's responsibility to have 
to have fun and create fun for everyone else. And the game master is a player too. Always remember that they're not just the evil overlord that you're fighting. So, <laughs> and game masters remember that you're not the evil overlord that or is going to tell everybody what to do. So, just to gently guide, not force. Right. So, and also all of us kind of had the same opinion, which was cool because we all got to kind of just bounce the same idea back and forth like a beach ball. But if there's anyone out there who thinks that as the GM, you should have full control over the story, please reach out and let us know because it would be really interesting to hear your opinion on it since uh, all of us had the same one. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and uh, come on to our discord uh, at, at tiny URL dot, uh, uh, f- com slash full metal discord or come to fullmetalrpg.com, which I'm going to transition to now. I'm going to show you fullmetalrpg.com. If you want to join our Discord, you can just click join our Discord, and it will come right up, and you just join. And we have the best Discord community I have been in. They are always energetic and interested in new ideas and new things, and and it keeps us on our toes. And uh, the patrons that are on there are enjoying the Borkborg actual play, so you can you know, join our Patreon and, and keep us here because without it, we would probably be still in all audio and maybe a bit, we would probably still do it, but we'd be very much spottier than we are. <laughs> Just be honest about these things. If we did not have the beautiful patrons that we have. Um, and then you should check out our merch store and check out like, you know, our are, are amazing and I'm going to switch back you can for a full metal you know right that we dare told us about drugs we tell you about RPGs so what is an RPG look at like and that's what we do so um yeah please uh please you know give us feedback let us know uh and uh we had a lot of fun today I did at least so uh everybody right on. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up and watching. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and transition us out of here as soon as I find the outro. <laughs> <laughs>